Good morning. Welcome to Liberty Church. I'm so glad that you could join us as we worship our God and King together on this Sabbath day, uh, although we are still worshiping virtually. I uh, want to also remind you that uh, during this extensive quarantine that we are all going through, the session and church leaders are actively praying for you, uh, lifting you up to the Lord. Just any needs that you may have, any prayer requests, I want to just ask and urge you to, to contact the church, contact your shepherding elder. We would love to pray for you um, as we pray together. Also pray over uh, the phone uh, perhaps with you. I uh, do have some exciting news. Uh, as you probably all are well aware, there's been some recent developments with Baltimore County in terms of opening up uh, churches for worship, for live worship, and, and uh, that just uh, went into place this past Friday. And uh, I want to uh, let you all know that our plan as the session is to uh, begin in-person live worship on Sunday morning starting this next Sunday, which would be June 7th. And we have met together extensively as a session to uh, hammer out some guidelines. Uh, We are assuming that the uh, mandate for live worship will include a 50% capacity. And uh, going off that, we have uh, come up with some guidelines that we have just sent to the church, uh, sent to everyone via the uh, uh, mail, the email um, list, and also that will be on the website of the church as well. So we have some guidelines just to help with the the balance and the tension of uh, the physical health of the congregation, as well as the desire to open up for live worship in order to. Uh, foster the spiritual health of the congregation. And those things are, are very important to keep in mind. Uh, we want, and we want to consider both of those, the physical health as well as the spiritual health. So I'm, I'm excited, um, and uh, I hope that uh, all goes well. And, and again, there will be some details about the, uh, the worship on the website as well as an email sent to the church. And if you have any questions or if you have any thoughts or suggestions, uh, please feel free to contact the church. We are going to continue to be doing our Sunday school through Zoom, and that will take place at 9 o'clock in the morning. And I'll give uh, everyone time to, uh, to finish the Sunday school and uh, come to church at the normal starting time of 1045. So that Zoom Sunday school will still be taking place with Elder Steve Madden. And now as we prepare to worship, let us prepare our own hearts and silently reflect upon the word of our God. Hear now the call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Father, at a time when we can doubt your goodness, and perhaps even your faithfulness, as we struggle with the anxiety and the loneliness that comes from this quarantine, let us hold fast to your word and let us stand upon the rock of truth you are a good God and you love your children dearly and nothing has taken you by surprise father we trust you and we come together this morning to worship you to glorify your name and we pray that you would hear our worship and that you 
would be pleased, O Almighty God. And we do all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let us stand and worship our God and King by singing Christ is Mine Forevermore, printed in your bulletins, which you can get also online. I forgot to mention, Christ is Mine Forevermore. Let us sing.
the beauty and paradox of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is ours forever and nothing can snatch us out of his hand and yet we still fall into sin daily grievous sin that that uh, hurts the heart of our God and so we come together and we confess our sins corporately uh, lifting them up to him who does forgive and our confession of sin is taken from Psalm 51 please pray this prayer of confession with me have mercy on me O God According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Let us take some time and silently confess to the Lord your own personal and and private sins. Hear now the Lord's forgiveness to you, his child, his son and daughter, those who have exercised faith in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. God, the Father, has pardoned you. Hear his assurance of this pardon taken from the same Psalm 51. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is exactly what God has done for those who are in Jesus Christ. Has removed your heart of stone, has given you a heart of flesh, a heart that now can respond to God's divine promptings. We are his children. Let us sing to him this glorious truth by praising him with Jesus paid it all. the throne 
Good morning, Liberty Church, and thank you, Praise Team, for the blessing of music during this virtual worship service. As is our custom, will you stand for the reading of God's word? Now hear the word of the Lord from Luke 21, verses 29 through 38. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you can see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place, and to stand before him, the Son of Man. And every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the evening, excuse me, and early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. This ends the reading of God's inspired word. Please be seated. Lord God, we thank you for this day of worship set aside to honor you for who you are and your great mercy to us. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we worship you as the one true triune God of all. God the Father, who from all eternity has created and sustained all things, you are all-powerful, omniscient, full of love and grace, the one who has ordained the way of salvation to provide a means that we as sinful creatures can be made acceptable in your eyes. For we have sinned before a holy God and caused a great chasm to exist between you and us. 
But it was your plan to send Jesus to pay the penalty for these sins that we might stand before you acceptable in your sight. And after accomplishing such a great sacrifice on the cross on our behalf, Jesus was risen to show that the sacrifice was accepted and the ransom paid. And now, Holy Spirit, that indwells us as believers, teach us to lead acceptable lives, to serve one another, and to worship you this day in spirit and in truth. Thank you for our many blessings, our church family and friends, and the benefit of this life for every day that you have given us. Lord, today I pray for our country, for there are many problems confronting our nation and our people. Lord, we are grieved by the senseless murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, and we are grieved by the violence that has followed. Lord, comfort those that are grieving, grant restraint to those prone to violence, and give wisdom to the many magistrates that are dealing with the situation. I would also pray that during this time of coronavirus, you would protect us and help our country to safely begin to function again as a society. Be with those whose livelihoods have been impacted and allow them to restart to work in a safe manner. Be with us as a church as we actively plan for our first gathering together for Sunday worship since the beginning of the coronavirus shutdown. Lord, we do yearn to gather together as your body to stimulate one another in love and good deeds and encourage one another all the more as we see the day drawing near when you will make yourself known to all mankind. Thank you for teaching us to live even through trial and temptation, to trust in you, your word, and who you are. We rest in your will, O Lord, with all our heart, our souls, and our mind. We want to learn all that you have to teach us through this health and financial crisis. We do lift up our president, our governor, and our county executives before you and pray for them. You have sovereignly placed them in authority over us, and we pray that, you would, that they would seek your counsel as you guide them in your perfect will. For you hold the hearts, minds, and actions of all men in your hands, and we pray that you would speak to them. Lord, as we face an uncertain future, help us to take all proper means with energy and zeal to be responsible for all that we do even as we entrust and submit ourselves to your wisdom and entrust the outcome to your hand. We pray for our missionaries who are ministering overseas in your name. We pray that you would protect them and bless their labors as they seek to serve you. We pray for their outreach and that through them, your gospel would be provided to those that they are ministering to. Lord, we thank you for the continuing resources to be able to support our missionaries, Liberty Christian School, as well as all the needed functions of Liberty Church. Meet the needs of our members that are under financial hardship and provide extra resources for the extended families that are under duress. I do pray for our pastors and their families that you would guard them and put a hedge of protection around them physically and spiritually. Help them to remain strong in your word and spirit. Use Pastor Barry today as your spokesman that Christ would be preached through him. Lord, we also lift up the spoken requests of our people. I pray for those in our congregation that need your healing hand. I lift up those who recently had operations and procedures, Jeff Watkins, Mary Jordan, and Chaz Tracy. We know that they are in your hands, Lord. You know their needs, and we pray that you would meet their every need. We thank you that Jan Duty has completed her chemotherapy, and we pray that it would be effective in removing the cancer from her body. 
We pray for those that are elderly in our congregation, for our widows and widowers who are more isolated at this time, that you would meet their needs and grant them your grace. We pray for the residents of Carroll Lutheran Village as they have had numerous cases of coronavirus at Carroll Lutheran. We would also pray for the several extended family members and friends of our church. We pray for Maxine Saylor's sister, Char, and her sister, Janine's grandson. We pray for Ola V. Jones, sister of Chuck Falk, who's hospitalized. And we pray for Vince Rosso, Mary Caldwell's son with cancer. We pray for the staff serving in hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living and long-term care facilities. Keep them safe from the coronavirus. And Lord, we do lift up the needs of all of our missionaries. We specifically pray for Craig and Ree Colburn staying in our missions house while back in the United States on leave. We lift up the needs of Liberty Christian School and all the challenges that they face, the students, teachers, staff, and school board members. Lord, be at work in our lives to draw us daily to your word, and we pray that, you would, that we would seek the attitude of Christ in our hearts. Help us to be more compassionate, more hopeful, and more obedient to you. Your word tells us, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of your great power. We give you thanks this day for who you are and what you have done in our lives. We pray that this worship service would be to your honor and glory. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Beloved, at this time in our service, we continue worshiping the Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings. God has been so gracious to us, and we show our gratitude by giving back to him a portion of how he has blessed us. So we encourage you uh, to continue to be faithful in giving, whether you do that through a check in the mail or uh, through our online uh, giving on our website. And, and thank you. Thank you for your faithful giving. We do appreciate it in this difficult time. Well, let's pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace, which you have shown to us through your beloved son, Jesus Christ, in providing him for us, who has taken away all of our sins and who has given us new life. We thank you for not only providing for us eternally, but also for your faithful provision for us in this life as well. So now we give back to you a portion of what you've given us, seeking your blessing upon these gifts for the sake of your kingdom. And Father, we also praise you for the gift of your word, which tells us how we can have eternal life with you through the word incarnate, Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we pray that you would now fill us with your spirit, that our hearts would be attentive and attuned to you, and that your word would do a mighty work in our hearts and in our lives. We ask this through Christ, whose name we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, if you have your Bibles handy or if you have your bulletins, uh, turn back to our passage for today, Luke 21, verses 29 through 38. Although you may want to have your Bibles open to Luke 21, as we will, as we will be looking at the previous verses as well in Luke 21. Well, I don't know about you, but it seems like it has been years rather than months since the COVID lockdown began. 
And when the lockdown warning came, I was driving home and I was listening to the news and there were reports of stores being overrun by people buying toilet paper and milk and hand sanitizer. And as I went home to self-isolate with my wife, I was thinking, you know, we're in pretty good shape. I'm sure we have what we need for the duration not realizing at that point how long this would go on. But then the next day, the next day I looked in the mirror and it struck me. There was one thing that I hadn't prepared for. And I realized that I should have gotten a haircut before we went down into lockdown. And now I couldn't. And what was I going to do? because my hair is really very difficult to cut. And even at my age, it grows very rapidly. And as it gets longer, it sort of does its own thing, which is mostly grow outward and upward because it has a life of its own. Well, about a month into the lockdown, Margaret looks at me across the breakfast table one morning and she says, Hon, your hair, your hair. And I said, I know, I know. She said, it's standing straight up. You look like B. Arthur from the Golden Girls. Well, we were filming the Sunday services, and what was I going to do? I was at a loss because I wasn't prepared. But fortunately, years ago, when my son left for college, he left behind a tube, a a super surfer hair gel. And it was still in the bathroom closet just waiting for me and COVID-19. So I found out that if I wet my hair and I kind of slather the hair gel over it, It cemented my hair to where I could form it into uh, something that resembled a plastic bike helmet. The hair gel got me through the lockdown. And all I can say is that the Lord provides. But the moral to the story is be prepared. Be prepared. And that is exactly Jesus' message to the disciples in today's passage. Be prepared. Be watchful. Because judgment is coming one day, and you need to be ready. And in this chapter, Jesus predicts two separate judgments. But each is for the same reason. Now, the first judgment Jesus predicted in Luke 21, that one has already happened. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple and of the nation of Israel as judgment for the rejection of him as Messiah. But the second judgment is still yet to come, which we see in verses 25 through 28, the devastating universal judgment of all those who reject him as Messiah, which will occur in the last days of history when he returns again in victory to usher in a new heaven and a new earth. And how will we know when this last judgment will take place? Well, Jesus didn't give his disciples a date or a time, but he did give to them some warning signs to look for so that they would be prepared. He says in verse 29 through 31 that when you see a fig tree begin to bud in the spring, what do you know? Well, you know that summer is near. And likewise, he says that when you see these things taking place, when you see these signs happening, what are they? Well, they are signs like a siren blaring, warning that I am coming soon to bring judgment and to consummate my kingdom, that God's kingdom is near. Now, what are these signs that Jesus is talking about? Well, Jesus describes these signs in verse 8 through 12, where he is prophesying about the fall of Jerusalem. 
In verses 8 and 9, before judgment comes, Jesus says there will be false prophets claiming to be the Messiah who will try and lead God's people astray. And then in verses 9 and 10, before judgment comes, there will be another sign. There will be conflict between nations with wars and rumors of wars. And then in verse 11, we have yet another sign, chaos in nature with earthquakes and famines and disease and cosmic disturbances in the heavens. And then in verses 12 through 18, Jesus gives yet another sign that his followers will be persecuted because they live in a world hostile to Christ. But he will give them the words to speak and the words to witness despite their persecution, and they will be able to stand firm in the faith. And beloved, all these signs occurred before the first judgment. They all happened before the fall of Israel in 70 AD. And the thing is, the very same signs that heralded the impending judgment of Israel Well, they are the same signs that give warning to the final judgment of the world. False teachers, international conflict, chaos in nature, and persecution of Jesus' followers. So these signs, they remind us that Jesus is coming. And in Luke 21, it says, If Jesus is seeing two visions simultaneously... There's sort of a a double vision throughout this chapter in which Jesus' focus changes almost seamlessly from one vision of judgment to the other. He moves from predicting the more localized judgment of Israel in verses 20 through 24 to describing the universal judgment of the whole world in verses 25 through 27. So there is this connection that we see in Luke 21 between these two judgments. Israel's judgment for their rejection of the Messiah is like a movie trailer for the coming attraction of what is yet still to come. When King Jesus comes again on the last day to judge those who have rejected him and to consummate his kingdom. So what is Jesus saying in this chapter? Well, he's describing a period of history that we are a part of right now. The period of history that goes from the first advent to Jesus' second coming. And it is a period of history that is marked by these signs that remind us that he is coming back. Wars, pandemics, false teachers, natural disasters, and persecution. And this period of history is alluded to. It's wrapped up in one word in verse 32. And that word is generation, where Jesus says, this generation will not pass away until all these things happen. Now, this one verse has been the focus of much debate Because what Jesus is saying here is somewhat ambiguous. What does Jesus mean by this generation will not die before all these things occur? Well, we have to wonder, who is this generation? And what are all these things that will happen which these particular people will see? Now, I don't want to get too lost in the weeds here, but let's delve into this a little bit deeper. Normally, when we think of a generation, we think of a group of people who are all born and who live around the same time. For example, there's the greatest generation, the baby boomers, the millennials, Gen X, Y, and Z. And in scripture, this is the usual definition of generation, that being of a group of people whose lifetime spans a particular period of about 40 years. And if that is the case, if Jesus means that definition of generation, then he is saying in verse 32 that, his, that the disciples of his day will not die off until all these things happen. 
Now, if Jesus meant solely the destruction of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem, then it would be very clear and it would make complete sense that he was referring to the generation of his day. He would be saying what actually occurred that many of the disciples of his day saw that first judgment, the fall of Israel, and that certainly all happened. And yet, here's the difficult part. Jesus said this generation will not pass away until what? Until all these things happen. And he said that in the context of not just the first judgment, but his second coming. In verse 27, in the preceding verse, Jesus uses apocalyptic language that echoes Daniel 7, 13, that the Son of Man will come in a cloud with power and with great glory, and that that Old Testament prophecy of Daniel 7 points to the end times when the Messiah will usher in a new world order in his universal reign over all the earth. So it is after that verse, verse 27, about Jesus' second coming, that Jesus then says, this generation will not pass away until all these things happen. Which would mean that that generation will not pass away until they see his second coming. And obviously, those first century disciples didn't see his second coming because it hadn't happened yet. So what did Jesus mean in verse 32? Who is this generation? Well, generation is more than one meaning in, in the Greek. It has more than one meaning in the Greek. Earlier, we said that it can mean a group of people who all are alive during a particular period of time. But generation can also describe a group of people who share the same characteristic, a group of people with the same trait, but whose lives span many different periods of time, not just the same one. An example of this use of generation would be Psalm 14, verse 5 where the psalmist says, God is with the generation of the righteous. In other words, a group of people who live throughout all the ages. And it might be then that this is how Jesus is using the term generation. A particular group of people who will not perish, who will see his second coming. And if that is the case, then what Jesus is saying here is this that this generation is my people. This generation is my church who will prevail. They will not be destroyed despite persecution and famine and war or disease, that my church, my church will press on from one generation to the next until I return. And if that is how generation is to be understood in this passage, then beloved, beloved, these words and these warnings are for us as well. They are as just as much for us today as they were for the first disciples. So when we hear of natural disasters and when we hear of pandemics, how should we think of these things? Well, we're in Matthew 24, verse 8 territory where Jesus says these things are but the birth pangs of a new creation to come. They are warning signs of Christ's return and his future final judgment. And they are to remind you, they are to remind you to question, am I ready for his appearing? Am I ready for his appearing. These are signs to wake us up, to remind us of the frailty and the finality of life, and to think about what lies beyond the grave. And oh, wow. 
Has that ever been made more real to us in these recent months? How a virus caused worldwide fear. And why? Because people fear death. And such things cause us to wonder about ultimate realities and ultimate destinies. So, beloved, are we in the end times? Why, yes, we are. We have been in the end times since Christ rose again and ascended into heaven. We have been in the end times. And we do not know then what day or hour when he will return. So we live in this time between two times, between two advents. And in this current chapter of God's plan, we have redemption. We have redemption in the sense of the forgiveness of sins, but we wait the fuller and final redemption to come when Christ appears again to consummate his kingdom, when we will receive resurrection bodies like his, and, we, and when John's prophetic re- vision on Revelation 21 becomes a reality for us, where John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Well, knowing this truth, how should we wait for him? Well, we don't have to guess. Jesus gives us clear instruction in the remaining verses. Starting in verse 34, he says that we are to watch ourselves to examine our lives, to do some self-evaluation in order to make sure that we are ready for Christ when he comes. We are to look at our lives as we look forward to Christ's second coming. And notice what he says in verse 34 about what we are to watch out for. We are to be careful that our hearts are not to be weighed down with two, with several things. First of all, we are not to be consumed with dissipation and drunkenness. Dissipation and drunkenness. Now, now that's odd. Of, of all the things that Jesus could mention to be not focused on, he mentions dissipation and drunkenness. And why is that? Well, what are some reasons that people get drunk? They get drunk to escape the trials of life. They get drunk to find comfort or solace. They get drunk because they think that will free them up or that they'll find some pleasure. Well, think about that. Comfort, solace, lasting pleasure, and freedom All of those things, all of those things are found in a relationship with Christ. So for the Christian to engage in dissipation or debauchery, what's that like? It's like trying to find your solace and comfort in something other than Christ. It's a way to find comfort in Jack Daniels rather than in King Jesus. 
And to follow that path as a Christian is to enter into a kind of a, a spiritual amnesia, a forgetting who Christ is and what he has done for you, to act as, as if you really don't know him, and you don't love him. It's a spiritual adultery. Over the years, I have counseled so many Christian men who struggle with porn. And I believe it's absolutely rampant in Christ's church. And often when I ask these men, how did you get hooked? They will say, well, it was an escape. Porn was my personal comfort food. And what happens to them? What happens to them is what Jesus says here, that their hearts become weighed down, that they feel a weight of guilt and shame. They are weighed down as if porn is a chain that imprisons them, and they feel trapped. And the very thing that they think will bring them some sort of pleasure ends up causing them so much pain for them and for their spouses. Well, Jesus may have more in mind here than just abuse of alcohol <clears throat> in this warning against drunkenness. As one commentator mentions, drunkenness is more than just inebriation but it's also being drunk on one's own illusion. In other words, to be under the influence of false teaching or false thinking and the lies that the world entices us to accept and believe. What are those lies that, that, that they could be? Well, lies like you will find your fulfillment or identity in anything else other than Christ, whether it be your achievements or another person or your position. And as a Christian, beloved, that's a lie. It's an illusion that can never bring lasting fulfillment because we find all of those things, our identity and our fulfillment, ultimately in Christ himself. Well, Jesus goes on to say that we are to avoid also being weighed down by the cares of this world. And I think about how anxiety and worry rob us of our joy in Christ because we are weighed down by the cares of this world. And when we do, we take our eyes off of him and we stop looking up and all we can see are the problems around us. And it seems so overwhelming and daunting. And it seems like there's no escape. And we forget, we forget that we live under the sovereign love of King Jesus, who is our good shepherd, who cares for us, who feeds us, who never leaves us nor forsakes us, who restores our souls. Our vision is distracted and we are weighed down and we feel trapped, imprisoned by the trials and tribulations of this life and we feel that there's no way out. Or we are hurt by others and then we become enslaved, weighed down by the bitterness we feel towards them and it just weighs us down. And in those times, in those moments, we lose our sense of vision. And we do not see that Jesus is coming. Who will right every wrong and who will usher in a new world. Where there will be peace and justice which will reign forever. So beloved... What is the answer then to how we are to live? Well, we are to be watchful and woke, anticipating Christ's return, that day when Jesus says, which will come suddenly like a trap. 
So what does that mean? What does that look like to be anticipating Christ's return, which could come at any day? Well, being ready is really about being intentional about your life, about the daily choices that you make. Isn't it really about the ongoing commitment to put Christ first in your life before all other things? To have your heart centered on him where there is freedom rather than to be weighed down by other things? So what does it mean to be ready for Jesus? Well, it means having a genuine faith in him. It means having a real relationship with him where you trust in what he has done for you out of his love and out of his grace toward you in saving you from your sin and from eternal judgment. And because of that, because of what he's done for you, you love him. For after all, as as 1 John 4.19 says, we love him because he first loved us. And so you respond to his love and to his grace to you. With what? With gratitude and devotion to him. We love Christ because he rescued us. And out of that love, we want to please him by living the way he desires as revealed in his word. And so for the believer... When Christ appears, it won't be what you may have heard growing up when you were a kid. Wait till your father gets home. When you did something wrong and you knew that you were in big trouble. But when we see Jesus, it will be joyful. It'll be like the joy that a young bride has when her husband returns from being on a long trip. And scripture hints at that joy. It hints at the joy in several ways. And in verse 28, Jesus says, when I appear, when I appear, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And again, in verse 36, that Jesus says that when he returns, we will stand before him. And what a beautiful, beautiful picture of what it means to know Jesus. Notice the contrast between these verses and verse 34, that when he comes, our hearts will not be weighed down with shame, that when he comes again, we will not be looking down in guilt and shame, but we will be looking up with love and with joy into the face of our dear Savior who has forgiven us for all of our sins. And because we have been forgiven, because we have been forgiven, we can stand up strong without cowering in fear of condemnation. We can stand strong in the light of Jesus' holiness, because all, all the filthy rags of our sin have been destroyed, and instead we are clothed in the magnificent, pure garments of Christ's righteousness, fully forgiven, freely accepted, and loved unconditionally. So beloved, There is freedom in our relationship with Christ. Freedom from fear and there is joy and anticipation as we await his coming. As we say, come Lord Jesus, come. Because your people long for the day when Revelation 21 becomes 3D. And knowing that Jesus is coming back and knowing that he could return at any moment, does it give you a sense of urgency? 
Does it give you a desire to redeem the time, to make the most of your days, to be a witness for him, to tell others about Jesus, knowing that he is coming back and there are so many around us that need to hear the good news? Does it encourage you to pray for those around you? And is in prayer one of the things that Jesus tells us to do while we await for his appearing? In verse 36, Jesus says that we are to be awake and in prayer, to pray for the supernatural strength to persevere through all the trials and travails that will occur before he comes again, to get through them with our faith intact and our vision focused on Christ, and we do that through prayer. So beloved, are you ready? Are you ready? What does it look like for you to have Christ in your life? What does it look like in your life to be ready for his coming? How does the reality of Christ's second coming make any impact on your thinking, on your choices, on your most personal relationships, on how you study or how you do your job? How does Jesus' return affect how you view yourself, how you value yourself as a person and your identity? How does Jesus' return help you handle your frustrations or your anger? Does it help you to frame how you think about, how you think and how you respond to injustice or to loss or to disappointment? How does Jesus' vision of his return affect your vision of your life? Because if Christ is real, and he's real, and if he's really coming back, and you know that, and you believe that, then that truth has real ramifications for your life. So, beloved, it's really good to know the end so that you can live wisely in the here and the now. And scripture says it better than I ever could. John writes in chapter 3 of his first epistle, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we will see him as he is. And because of that truth, John goes on to say in verse 3, and everyone who thus hopes in Christ and his appearing does what? Well, they purify themselves as he is pure. Oh, what a, a vision of the glorious future that awaits us as Christ comes to consummate his kingdom so, are you ready for his appearing? Let's pray. Oh, Father God, how we thank you for your grace and your mercy shown to us through your Son, our Savior, who has given us new life, who has given us real hope, and eternal joy. And Lord, as we hear of wars and rumors of wars, of riots and, in, and of injustice and of disease, all of these events remind us that this world will end one day when you come again. And Lord, we praise you for that day and we look forward to that day saying, come, Lord Jesus, come. That day 
which you will bring about a new heaven and a new earth and all of the sin and the evil and the pain of this world will pass away once and for all when you consummate your perfect kingdom of truth and of justice and of wholeness and of life and when we will be able to look into your radiant, beautiful face to look back at you with a love that you have poured out upon us. So we thank you and we praise you, Father, for this wonderful truth and this wonderful reality. Until then, we ask that you would indeed strengthen us by your Spirit, that we would not fear, that we would not lose heart, but stand strong in our faith, seeking to be a witness to you and of your grace and mercy shown to us through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, as we close our worship service this morning, turn with me to your bulletin as we sing together, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's stand and sing.
shall reap he and not I, but through Christ in me. And not I, but through Christ in me. And not I, but through Christ in me. Beloved in Christ, receive his benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.